I'm Duncan Lustig Green. I was born in 1959, lived on the Isle of Wight all my life growing up, and joined the Navy in 1979. My pronouns are he and him. Excellent. Um, and I'm Melissa Gilmore. I'm a volunteer for Out in Island. I've been volunteering with them for nearly two years. And this is Queries, a video series from Alternan Island, um, which is an LGBTQ plus or history project from Stonecaps Theatre, which is based on the Isle of Wight and funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, OK, so I thought we'd start off by um, talking a little bit about your childhood um what kind of memories or um sense of your childhood do you still have i was a happy child i was uh, very lucky living in ride uh good very caring parents i was a little so and so and anyone who remembers me from my childhood i am sorry uh but I was nurtured and despite my naughtiness and impossibility, uh, I managed to get through school eventually. Uh, Ride High School was the place that actually helped me to grow up. Uh, I was very lucky to be taken under the wing of the last longshoreman on the Isle of Wight, Murray Oakham, who worked at Ride. Uh, I cleaned the litter on the beaches for him for many years until I was in my 20s actually in the summer holidays and also with him ran the boat patrol on the sandbanks at Ride every summer. So I grew up and found that I was increasingly loving the sea and then I disappeared off to college. Growing up on the island is fine until you reach your early teens, certainly in the 70s it was, because suddenly you're becoming increasingly aware that you're different. And in those days, it was only very recently that the law had been partially decriminalizing homosexuality for gay men just a few years before. And the atmosphere on the island was particularly hostile. The county press would frequently print the names, addresses and photographs of men who'd been caught cottaging, for example. I knew of two or three suicides of men like that who had been exposed that way. I was aware of things going on in public toilets with police activity trying to entrap people. Indeed, I met one of my old school friends in a toilet one day who had joined the police and he was being used as the jailbait for that. Um, so it was a hostile environment. And of course, Islanders will know that it's a fairly close community and we all know what everyone's doing and we all like looking out from under our lace curtains to see what they're doing so to be gay to be different was actually quite difficult in those immediate partial decriminalization years i joined the navy almost by accident i went off to music college i studied first at the royal college of music and then i went off to birmingham and Birmingham is a place where you can't really get further from the sea. Uh, one day I was walking home and I spotted a naval headquarters very incongruously in a main shopping street in, Bright, in, in Birmingham above the Rum Runner Club, which is where Duran Duran started. And in the windows I had pictures of ships and it was a recruiting office and a training headquarters for the Royal Naval Reserve. And so I walked in and signed up. It wasn't as easy as that, as that because I had foreign parents and so I had to wait for a whole year for security clearances and endless questions and letters from the Ministry of Defence until eventually it was approved and I joined up in Birmingham as a radio operator and shortly after that, a couple of years later, was promoted to officer and then I joined the Royal Navy proper when I left college and went to Dartmouth. Of course, the law then was very different in the armed forces. I knew, or I thought I knew, that I couldn't commit a sexual act in the Navy. That seemed to me to be totally sensible, and actually still seems to me to be sensible. We didn't have women serving in the front line or at sea. So if you were going to have sex, it was going to be gay sex. And call me old fashioned, but Relationships in the office, in the workplace, generally are disruptive, whether they're gay or straight. And so I thought that the rules were actually quite sensible. I managed to get through training and I joined my first ship as a fully trained officer. And it was on the second day of that 
ship that I opened a letter addressed to my captain. I was his secretary. And it was a special investigation report by the military police about one of our sailors who happened to be gay. And I remember this cold, sweaty fear coming over me as I read it. And I grabbed it and took the report to the privacy of my cabin, lest I be suspected of being gay just by reading it. And to my horror, I found that I was as guilty as this young lad was. He was uh, only 17. He'd never had sex, but he'd confessed to a friend who he thought he could trust that he was gay. And because of that, he was arrested by military police. His lockers, the space he lived in in the mess deck was searched. His colleagues were questioned. Even his parents, who didn't know he was gay, had a visit from the military police, who then outed him and interrogated his parents. And those questions and those interrogations for him lasted three days, even though they had the information already. He'd confessed to being gay to a friend and said straight away, yes, I am. His only crime was actually thought crime, and yet he was treated as if he'd committed a sexual offence or been a rapist. And from that moment on, I suddenly realised that my naive interpretation of the rules rendered me as in difficulty as he was. And I did a bit of further investigation. And I found a Defence Council instruction, which is a book of rules for commanding officers and duty officers and for medical officers, which was issued in 1976 and was still in force in that time in 1983, which said that how I should be separated from Avant crew members if I was suspected of being gay, how duty officers should look to see if there was evidence of me using makeup, if my lockers showed any evidence of products which could be used as lubricants like hand cream or Vaseline, things like that, whether I was effeminate, And then it gave instructions to medical officers on how they should examine me. And that was a strip search on paper so that they could collect any evidence that came off me. My clothes should be bagged. I should have an internal examination to see if I was receptive in anal sex and whether there was any evidence of other signs of being gay. And for me, it was an absolutely horrific moment because from that freedom of the Navy, I suddenly felt very firmly back into a a closet. But I thought I could get around it. I loved the Royal Navy. I loved the people I was with. I had a boyfriend in Birmingham. So to me, it didn't matter. I could live my life very discreetly, very privately. But there was a disadvantage to that. My cover story was that I was married to the job. So when the lads went out, on their runs ashore and the girls around and we wanted to, or they wanted to meet girls. I would either be on duty because I volunteered or I was always married to the job and really not interested in girls. I just wanted a career. The other disadvantage is that you get very, very close to people in the armed forces. After all, these are people that you trust with your life. You know that they will take a bullet for you and they know you will for them. And to have to lie to them every time you talk about what's going on at home is really, really painful. For most people now, it's very easy to answer the question, what did you do over the weekend? But for a lesbian or gay man in the 70s and 80s in the military, the answer to that question was inevitably going to be a lie. And lying to people who are friends and close colleagues you trust so implicitly is deeply painful. So there are many friendships who... At the time, I never pursued. I was quite happy when every 18 months for two years, I'd move on from ship to ship to job to job because I could break contact and no one would get so close that it would be asking questions of why Why have we never been to his house? Why, why does he never invite us home? Why do we never see a girlfriend? I always tried to sort of break that. Well, I thought I broke it, but of course, sailors are not stupid. And as most of them tease me now, they all knew anyway, they all understood, but to them it didn't matter. But the system was against me then. 
My career was terrific. I had a very, very lucky career. I was promoted early all the way. I had some really great choice jobs. And it was on my last ship, HMS Newcastle, when after 18 months on board, the time had come for me to think about moving on to my next post. And I went off to London to visit the officer who's responsible for appointing officers to their, their next jobs. Now, usually these are a fairly formal meeting where, well, you've done quite well, lad, so off you go to this job. Or uh, we're going to have to send you here because I think you need a bit more experience. Well, in fact, what happened was uh, he offered me the choice of three jobs. And the job that I really raised my eyebrows at and grasped with both hands was military advisor to the prime minister. John Major, as it was then. So I came back to the ship. I was absolutely on a high. And I celebrated in the captain's cabin with a glass of whiskey together when one of the stewards came in and he said, oh, sir, there's a, a message from your mother. Could you ring her urgently, please? This was incredibly unusual for me. And I had a very sinking feeling in my stomach. So I rang mum and she said, I don't know what it's about, but this person has been ringing a couple of times and asks you to ring him on this number, but not from the ship. And instinctively, I knew what it was about. You see, every gay person in those days exercised the possibility in their mind of being outed, of being blackmailed, of making a mistake. And I just had that instinct that this was happening. I rang this guy. I didn't know his name. I'd never met him before. And he said, I want to meet you in London tonight. And I said, I'm sorry, but I don't go around the country meeting strange people I've never heard of. What's it all about? It's about an investigation. You need to see me. So that evening I emptied out anything from my cabin which could be classed as incriminating. Well, what's incriminating? Uh, a secret picture of my boyfriend looking quite normally like a normal man and a few of his letters. And we never signed our letters in our names. It was always signed Love M. Um, we were that careful in those days, but I removed them. And on the drive up to London, I buried them under a bush just outside the city. And then I met him at half past midnight in Waterloo Station underneath the clock, having cased the joint first like some furtive criminal or a John le Carre spy thriller. And met him and we walked along the embankment. And he told me that he discovered I was gay and if I made it worth his mark while, he would keep it quiet. At which point I said to him, well, you can bugger off, because before I get you get anywhere near the military police, I will have told them. I drove back to the ship. I don't remember sleeping that night. I just remember sweating in my bed, fearful of the knock on the door. And then the next day, which was a Friday, and we, in the Navy, if you're not working on a Friday as a ship, they'll release you at 12 o'clock. I don't remember what the hell I did. I'm sure I signed signals and author, gave orders and authorised things but I don't remember a detail of that day. And I drove home and discussed with my boyfriend and a few friends what I felt that I had to do, which was to report this approach to the military police on the Monday. I gained some advice from a very good organisation, all of ex-service personnel called Rank Outsiders over that weekend. And I spoke to a naval officer, former naval officer, who had lost his partner. He'd actually left the Navy to care for his partner, who was HIV positive. But his partner died just two days before he left. But I got the most sterling advice from him. And so on the Monday morning, I rang up my friend, who was the head of special investigation branch. He'd worked for me when I'd worked for an admiral. And I rang him and I said, Richard, I need to come and see you this morning. And he said, certainly, yes, when's good for you? I said, oh, Richard, nine o'clock, is that all right for you? Yes, I said, it's fine. Come for coffee, come for biscuits, be nice to catch up. 
My captain arrived. I told him why I was going. Not in too much detail. I didn't want him to be too troubled and bothered with the details. And he tried to persuade me not to go. And I said, you know, Alan, this is something I have to do. I don't want you to know too much, but I have to do it. Walked into the uh, office of my former friend, Richard, and he had the coffee there and there were some nice biscuits. And he said, right, what's the problem, Duncan? How can I help you? I said, well, Richard, I'm being blackmailed. Black blackmailed. Right, okay. Give me the details of this bastard and we'll sort him out for you. Why are you being blackmailed? Because I'm gay. And there was this long pause and he looked at me straight in the eye and said, are you telling me that you're homosexual? Yes, Richard, I am. In that case, you're not obliged to say anything, but anything you do say will be taken down in effort. And then the coffee cups disappeared and I was taken to an interview room for a recorded tape in front of a master at arms and with uh, Richard uh, about my private life. Now, I refused to give any details of the, to the questions that they asked, which included such things as, are you HIV positive? And uh, are you active or are you passive? And how many boyfriends do you have? So quite detailed questions. But I had the advantage. I, had, I was a senior officer. I'd seen these investigations several times before. So I knew the sort of questions they asked. And so I was able to stand up, know my rights and say, you know that I'm gay. That's all you need to know. I'm coming to you because I'm being blackmailed. So yeah, I don't need to answer those current questions. Anyway, went back to the ship. It was by now 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock on a Monday morning was always the time when us heads of department in the command team gave our instructions to the junior officers and the senior management of the ship about the week ahead. And I was late for the meeting. And I walked in and had to give my brief for my department. Almost surreal because I knew that probably by the end of that week, I would no longer be on board the ship. My captain, unbeknown to me, was furious with the Ministry of Defence and his admiral uh, and was shouting about keeping me on board the ship. I'd had a private conversation with him. I said, look, I, I don't want to leave you in the lurch. I'll stay with the ship and I'll, I'll keep running things until my successor is appointed. But within a couple of days, it was very clear that as a gay man, I couldn't be trusted. So public funds were taken off me and, and gradually all the powers that came with my post were disappearing. And so after a couple of days, I said to him, look, if I'm to be a head of department in name only, there's no point in me being here. I serve no useful purpose. So I think it's time for me to leave. And I had to tell him too to just watch his own conduct with his senior officers because I knew he was trying to defend me. Uh, but in so doing, I didn't want him to destroy his career. He didn't. I'm delighted to say he became a second sea lord before he retired. A few months later, after the process was done administratively, I was dismissed from the forces for being gay. I remember coming down for my final discharge medical in HMS Nelson in, Port, in Portsmouth and getting the eye from the junior medic who <laughs> checked me over uh, in the full knowledge because it said on my discharge papers why I was gay. And then I was finally interviewed by a surgeon captain. It was the same surgeon captain who'd done my entry medical. And he turned around to me and said, it was a waste of time doing your interview medical, wasn't it? To which I said, no, sir, I've had a brilliant career. Look at my record. Goodbye. And I stepped out of the dockyard, stepped out of HMS Nelson and drove away from Portsmouth. And that was that. There was humour along the way. When I left the ship, finally, my uh, chief petty officer head of staff and, and of my staff looked at a picture of me standing next to the Queen, which I kept on the balcony in my cabin. He looked at me and said, you know, boss, I always thought there was more than one Queen in that photograph. But that was the end of my career. 
I would have gone quietly. I was a very closeted gay man. Nobody other than my very close friends knew that I was gay. My parents didn't even know. But I got involved with Frank Outsiders partially because as somebody who'd worked in the administration and personnel of the Royal Navy at a senior level, I did have knowledge about how we should be dealing with cases as they came through, men and women. Uh, so I was giving them my support and giving advice and getting more and more involved in the welfare of people who were, had been or were in my position. It was uh, on one of those cases that my mind changed and I suddenly realised I needed to play a much bigger role. I was asked by the police to go to Plymouth at the rush uh, because of a sailor, a 16-year-old sailor, who was uh, threatening to commit suicide on the Tamar Bridge. He'd been interviewed that day by military police because someone had discovered he was gay. It was one of the worst interviews I'd ever read. Uh, and he thought, I'm losing my job. I'm probably going to lose. My parents will throw me out. I'll lose my home. I've lost my pension. I've lost everything. And he saw no future. And we sat on the bridge together in the middle of the night in the pouring rain, because it is Plymouth, it always rains there, and eventually talked him down and persuaded him that actually there was life after the forces and we could do something to go and get him on the straight and narrow. It struck me that if I was worth the commander's rank, I had to stand up for men and women like him who had no voice and say this is wrong. And so from that moment on, I really turned my attention to fighting the campaign and how we could challenge this whole mess that was destroying lives and leaving, frankly, suicides and huge economic harm and psychological damage with so many people. Because we were sacking anything between 70 and 100 people a year from the armed forces, not for anything they'd done, but just for being who they were. And we were doing it in the cruelest way. And that was unacceptable. And so in 1994, the Legal Action Group was established to try and persuade organisations like Stonewall and others to fund a challenge in the courts and the European Court of Human Rights. Now, that very first meeting of the Legal Action Group, I turned up in a suit because I'm a naval officer after all, so I'll dress in a suit and tie which immediately, immediately made them feel rather suspicious, especially when various points were being made by solicitors and others. And I would say, no, no, Queen's Regulation, Article 5, Paragraph 6, would actually disagree with you there, and this is how you'd get round it. And I, unbeknown to me, they all thought that I was a, a stooge from the Ministry of Defence come to spy on them all. But, of course, they realised that I was fairly useful to, to give them more information from the inside, if you like. I was really surprised when I was selected as one of the four test cases. I understand now why that happened, but at the time I didn't think it would be me, nor, nor was it really something I wanted. Uh, but they wanted an officer, they wanted a woman, they wanted an ordinary sailor, they wanted a selection of every sort of rank, non-commissioned and commissioned, and both uh, men and women, so that we could establish once and for all in the courts with no get-out clause for the Ministry of Defence. And of course, under law, we had to be three months with, within discharge, and we also had to have utterly clean records. There was no use trying to go to court with a case where they could argue, no, this person was actually not very good at their job, so we're sacking them not because they were gay, really, but because they were not that competent, frankly. No, these were well, all four of us were people who were superb at our jobs and had not a blemish on our record. Of course, I had to tell my parents. And I remember coming back to the island several times to do that. And I just chickened out every single time. I had preconceptions about mum and dad. My father came from an Austrian Catholic family. He had been trained in a military school. Um, to me, he was always the disciplinarian, although as I grew older, the more close we got. So I assumed that his attitude would be 
incredibly hostile, Mum, I suspected, would be okay. Eventually, the Guardian were on my back wanting to release a story about me, and I managed to persuade them, and jolly good for the Guardian, not to print that week so that I could tell my parents first. So I, I went home and my boyfriend came with me and secretly stayed on the Isle of Wight trying to encourage me. It was only last minute on the Sunday before I had to go back that I had to tell, had no choice but to tell my parents. And I started with mum, who was doing the washing up, back to me. So it was a uh, Mum, I have something to tell you. Oh, what is it, darling? Um, well, I'm leaving the Navy. Oh, why is that? I said, well, uh, it's because I'm gay. Oh, I thought it must be something like that, because you're so good at your job and you love it. Better go and tell your father. So uh, off I went to Dad. Now, if you're gay, my suggestion to you is that you don't attempt to tell your father that you're gay when he's watching football. But that was my last opportunity. So eventually I sort of said, Dad, um, I need to talk to you. Oh, what's the matter? I'm having to leave the Navy. Why are you leaving the Navy? Uh, it's for security reasons. No, oh, um, what's the security reasons? Well, I, I'm probably going to fail my vetting. Why would you fail your vetting? Well, um, suspicion of homosexuality. My father turned off the television. Is it true? Yeah, it is. Oh, well, then you must sue them. It's unfair dismissal. And that was actually to become my one of my greatest supporters and was so fascinated in the macerations of the politics behind it and what we were doing behind the scenes. And so I was lucky. Both parents were instinctively and instantly supportive. So off we went, we went to the camp, uh, with the campaign. Uh, I ought to say that my mother reminded me I had to tell my brother, who was playing table tennis in Germany and not chew back. When he arrived back, he, uh, my mother said to him, oh, we need to talk to you about Duncan. My brother said, oh, is it about the gay thing? I saw it on the front page of the Daily Mail on the plane. So <laughs> he was cool as well. Anyway, the campaign ran on. We went to court. The interest was intense. Um, which I think is a warning for anyone who's in this sort of thing, and it's a personal thing to you. It's easier being a campaigner when an organisation pays you for it or you're just a volunteer, but when it's a story about you, it, there is a nudity about appearing at interview on camera when it's your own story that uh, I think is missing when you're just doing it because you're paid to do it. The first court case uh, was in the High Court. Uh, Lord Justice Simon Brown uh, and his two colleagues were incredibly critical of the Ministry of Defence. They thought that the nature of the investigations the four of us had endured were incredible. They could not, they said, understand the nature of these investigations. They were highly sympathetic. They said that they were highly sympathetic to each of us, but the law as it stood was not on our side, and they regretted that it would be necessary for us to endure the delay and expense of going all the way to Europe to seek the proper resolution. The Court of Appeal, in their judgment a couple of months later, were equally as sympathetic. And then the House of Lords, well, they never even sat to hear the case. They rejected it uh, just on the papers, which, great, it saved the cost of a hearing, and all they'd have done would have been to have delayed the inevitable of going to Europe. Of course, at this stage, you become either a, you, you get people who hate you. Um, I did get the occasional letter that was hostile. The vast majority, the overwhelming majority from ordinary members of the public were incredibly supportive. I was aware, because the police briefed me, that I had uh, gone up several notches uh, on far right groups' hit lists, um, which didn't really bother me. Uh, it was interesting to note that there were armed police above the buildings opposite the High Court when we came out and were giving interviews, uh, and that was because there had been a threat that day against us. But one day, and I lived in a block of flats with a secure communal front door, an envelope, unmarked, appeared in my own personal letterbox at home in London, 
and inside was a nine millimeter live round. I called the police and I don't think they took me seriously. And they said, well, how do you know it's a live round? I said, I'm ex-military. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what as well, it's more than a live round. Looking at the batch number, it is either military or police issue, nine millimeter revolver round. And they paused and said, we'll get, get right around to you. And they took it away. Classic sort of threat, you shut up or we're gonna get you. It's also not pleasant when you're followed by the Daily Mail, as it was for six months. Uh, I used to have fun leading them in circles around the place. And you don't try and follow a serviceman because, frankly, in those days, we were used to the troubles in Ireland. So we were quite used to evading and varying our routes and making sure that we weren't uh, in danger that way. Eventually, uh, in 1999, we were seen in the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. The European Court were itching to get our case. They put us in the truncated system, which meant that we got very quickly from the start of our case in 1994, when we lodged papers, to 1999 is incredibly fast. And we sat in front of a panel of 12 judges as they expressed clear a clear view. Their judgment came uh, a couple of months later, and that was the end of the bang. There had been a severe infringement on our right to privacy and respect for our family life, and there was no justifiable excuse for that. We knew that the Ministry of Defence was working on the post-ban policy. We knew because we were working with them. It always seems when you've got a case like this going on that it's very adversarial. Uh, that's what the media make it. That's what it appears like when you're on television debating with your enemies. But the reality is in order for this to work, the Ministry of Defence very wisely were consulting us and we were speaking to them open and honestly so that we could write the framework so that everybody would be protected, both gay and straight, when the policy changed. When in January 2000, uh, Jeff Hoon, the Defence Secretary, announced the lifting of the ban, everything was in place and we knew it was coming. In fact, we were all rushed up, the four of us, to the Labour, pa Labour Party uh, conference when the judgment was announced in the September before. Uh, and I ended up dancing with Mo Molan and uh, being congratulated by Labour. It was a shame that Labour didn't actually have the guts to change the policy themselves. But frankly, as the leader of the campaign, that was always in my game plan. It is much easier as a politician in opposition to deal with such changes. But when you have the Sun, the Express, the Daily Mail being very hostile and you're in power, it's much more difficult. And so I knew that we were gonna have to allow the excuse of the courts making the decision to change the law. Uh, so that was that. I had already made the decision that I would be retiring from my post as chair of Rank Outsiders. And from that side, it was important that new faces were seen in the Ministry of Defence and in the forces. And I needed time out anyway. I was exhausted after all that. But I did keep on privately giving advice to groups uh, out of the public limelight until really the sector the second decade of uh, the century, when I started becoming more active, not because I wanted to have the drug of going back on camera, but simply because I felt that I should be doing more now and paying back a bit. And in 2017, working together with Paul Johnson, professor from York University, we uh, approached the Ministry of Defence and we approached government and we asked them to change the law because there were still some passages in the Criminal Justice Act which pertain to uh, the LGBT community. It is the first time there's been a vote in both houses of parliament which was completely unopposed and they repealed that legislation. And at the same time, I got an assurance from the minister that they would push this forward for the Merchant Shipping Acts as well, which they did the next year. And since then, I've also been working on the Trinidad and Tobago campaign, which is really important because so many British colonies or former colonies run on 
penal codes which were left to them by us, the Brits, and which are incredibly anti-LGBTQ. And so the Trinidad test case is vital. It's going to be heard soon in our Supreme Court, in the, in the Privy Council. And so it's really important that we remove some of the horrible legacy we have given to the world from British colonialism. And then after that, I, I've been working on a project to build the Ledwood Centre, which is going to be a large community centre for the LGBTQ plus community in Brighton. And we're trying to make sure that we reach every culture, not just the white culture that would use the scene, but all those who wouldn't use the scene necessarily. So that's my story today. So that's your quite public um, story. I wonder if I could ask you some questions um, that are perhaps a bit more personal. Um, mostly kind of like, when did you start kind of being aware that you weren't heterosexual, that there was something a bit different about you? Surprisingly young. Um, I can remember where and when. It was in Nettlestone Primary School in the playground, and a friend of mine flashed his willy at me. I would have been about six years old, and I knew that I liked that. And I, <laughs> that's my very first memory. And I became aware that I was different, really, that developed from that point. Um, I didn't understand it. I would say I didn't understand what it was to be gay until I went to college. Um, it was too closeted on the Isle of Wight, I think, in those days to achieve that sort of knowledge of oneself. In fact, I used to, in my mind, think that I was going to be a dirty old man. That's how I used to think of myself as, uh, as a future adult. Mm. So, considering uh, your military career and the need for secrecy around um, the fact that you were gay, were you still able to kind of seek out a community? I know you mentioned that there were friends that knew you were gay and you obviously had met a boyfriend and um, had a partner. How, what was that like? How did you kind of find that while still maintaining the level of secrecy that you needed to? I was, I was really lucky because when I started my career for the first ooh, five or six years, I was with a boyfriend I'd met at college and we were living in Birmingham. And it, so that discretion was are very much at arm's length from from the navy. Um, my next boyfriend I met actually in Torquay. Uh, the golden rule was never be seen doing anything on your own doorstep. So I went off to Torquay and I actually uh, met him on the promenade one evening, uh, and we were together for seven years. So I was very lucky. Most of my time I had a boyfriend. Um, I was aware because I was reading the police reports, especially when I was in headquarters, that there were military surveillance operations on public toilets, on cruising areas, on gay pubs in the Southwest, in Portsmouth. You know, there was a pub in South Sea, which happens to be uh, just opposite a uh, DWP office, which long had surveillance cameras to see if there were any service personnel or potential service personnel going in there. So I knew what the climate was like. So it, that was really difficult. But I can give you an idea of the pain that that actually means. And I know earlier I talked about that difficulty of lying to friends and colleagues in the services, but there was another aspect of it because when you go away on a long deployment, and some of those deployments nowadays are um, a year, the longest I ever did was about eight months. It's a long time to be away from people you love and from family. And the families would come, and you've probably seen them on the local news, standing at the Round Tower at Portsmouth Harbour, waving off their ships as they, they go away for month and month on end. My boyfriend used to come, but he couldn't go on the top of the Round Tower. He used to hang on the underneath wall around South Sea, discreetly waving. I'd, I'd sort of slip out on the bridge and just, just wave with the side of my, my hand discreetly. And it, 
there was none of that support that the relatives could give each other for those when they saw their loved ones disappearing to see none of that support was available none of that sort of we're in it together feeling that all the rest of the lads on board had could i share in so that was a painful thing mm. having to be closeted for that long and having to having kind of the additional pressure of the military um, on top of that. How do you think that affected kind of your mental health? I think I was lucky. Um, for a start, I was significantly younger and probably more resilient. Um, and almost it was this is the way life has to be so this is sort of acceptance it wasn't something that was taken from me it was something that always was if you like um i think in terms of my ability my performance there's an awful lot of energy being wasted on secrecy of worrying about what you might say when you've had a drink or two with your friends if suddenly you talk about Martin as opposed to Martina or Phil as opposed to Phyllis because all my boyfriends I'd made sure I had in my mind a feminine name that I could give them uh, if ever that was to come out in conversation so you know it's a, a lot of wasted energy frankly but no mental health wise there was a pressure there there was that constant fear but I think that was a waste of my potential performance as opposed fortunately in my case and it wasn't the same for everybody i know uh it didn't affect my mental health in those days i suppose i also want to ask how those things have changed for you since you did come out and um or rather were made to come out because that's what it was um how has that being able to be visible? How has that changed things for you? It might surprise you for someone who was so public, uh, on camera, in the papers, constantly. It's alien to me because my upbringing on the island and then in the Navy was so closeted. I, even in that wonderful city of Brighton where it is cool to be gay, I will still hes hesitate, in fact, pull my hand away if my husband tries to hold my hand. It's pure instinct of survival. Uh, so I'm, I accept that I'm a dinosaur in the wrong place in a different generation, and I will probably never change. And I laugh at myself because I appreciate that that is pure conditioning of the closet and of the law as it was, and of really ingrained uh psychological pressure if you like manifesting itself now you know i'll always be private i don't think you know that's that's going to be me but i just wish that i could be a bit more expressive and expansive in public with my own husband for goodness sake we've been together 20 years <laughs> how do you think things have changed do you have a sense that things have changed um because certainly there's been progress made politically, socially. What has been kind of the most important or the things that stick out to you about how things have changed or if they have changed? Yes, there have been huge changes and it is wonderful to see members of the armed forces openly gay commanding officers of ships and establishments, openly gay. Uh, it is wonderful to, goodness, I was approached, this is many years ago, by someone in my old school uniform, say, you must have been 17 or 18, who actually was cruising me. And we ended up chatting and I said, we're having a little laugh, but even on the island, my goodness, there was a kid who felt confident uh, in school uniform to, to be openly gay. So yeah, there have been huge changes. 
but those changes are incredibly fragile and attitudes change and they're not universal. Go to some towns and cities in England, in Wales and Scotland and see what happens if you're perceived to be openly gay and you're in the wrong area or you meet the wrong crowd. Be transgendered or intersex anywhere in the United Kingdom and you will go through hell. Government is fickle. At the moment, we're seeing pressure on equalities throughout. The equalities minister right now has got rid of all her LGBTQ advisors. Trans rights are really, really in danger at the moment with threats to bring in something on the American lines of uh, banning trans kids from playing school sports, for example, in their true gender. So there are, there's hostile elements in the public, there is a hostility in government, and I don't think that we can afford to sit back and say, it's all right now, the fight is over, because it isn't. Attitudes change from month to month, and we're actually in a bad period at the moment. Mm -hmm. I suppose also, um, kind of perhaps to close things out what are your hopes for the future um but also what are your hopes of what people take away from your story well first takeaway i'd say is don't make the same mistakes as me i made the mistake of thinking that as a senior officer who was at the heart of running the organization and looking after the people who'd been in my position, that I had to play the stiff British upper lip of being a senior officer. I was just as much a victim of that policy as those people I was trying to help. So don't be afraid if you're campaigning or if you want to do change, or if you're just in your own community helping others, you are probably going to be just as much a victim of the experiences of the people you help as they are. So don't be afraid to show your emotion. Don't be afraid to seek help or ask for a chat with someone. That's my first piece of advice. The other takeaway I'd say is always be on your guard. Read the politics, read the people around you and challenge. Challenge appropriately, challenge constructively. Don't call someone a homophobe but try and explain why they're wrong, why there's a different way of perceiving other people. Thirdly, make sure that we are looking at the whole community. It's very easy to be a gay man in particular in Brighton. Umpteen places cater for, for you, whether it's drinking or going clubbing or everything else. Not so easy if you're a lesbian. Really hard if you're trans if you're black, if you're Muslim, if you're from the Chinese or South a East Asian communities. It's more or less impossible to have a social life and be involved in your community because everything that we do is around drugs or alcohol, frankly. And that is not the way that Muslims or Asian people want to uh, have a social life. So please make sure that you're involving everybody because the most difficult thing to be in this world is a minority within a minority. So if you're trans in the gay community, you're, speci you're particularly disadvantaged. If you're black, if you're Muslim, if you're Chinese, you're particularly disadvantaged if you're gay as a minority within a minority. So look after them because they'll come for them first, our enemies, and they'll be at our door next. Well, I think you for taking the time to speak with me um, and for being so open as well. My pleasure, Melissa. Thanks so much for having me.